statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, that stands out and acts a little bit like a theme to what his sermon is all about. The religious climate of the day was a mess. And Jesus comes on the scene and he calls a spade a spade. He says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the Pharisees in the first century, they considered themselves paragons of virtue. They were the religious elite. They were calling the shots in the synagogues and in Jerusalem. They claimed to be reverent students of God's Word. They were very meticulous about their religious ceremony and keeping their traditions. They were zealously evangelistic in their own way. They were upright and moral people. At least that's how they wanted people to see them. And Jesus, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, and especially later on, as He travels back to Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23, He emphasizes and shows His disciples that the Pharisees and the status quo in Jerusalem and the religious people of the day, that's what they emphasized. Appearances. They emphasized how they looked to other people. Of course, Jesus is the Son of God, and you can see all, through all that nonsense, straight to the heart of a person, and see what they do and why they do it. And what he could see there was self-righteousness. What he could see there in the heart of the Pharisees and the scribes was a legalistic attitude towards God's Word. And they even placed their faith in themselves rather than placing their faith and their trust in God. And they actually believed that law-keeping could somehow outweigh their sin. And so when a Savior came to them, they couldn't see Him as a Savior because they were not looking for a Savior in the first place. Because they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves for salvation. But Jesus points out again throughout the Sermon on the Mount that their piety... Their, their devotion to God's law was hypocritical. And they were being dishonest with themselves in the way that they presented themselves in public. Jesus told a parable about two men that went to the top of the mountain to pray. And the reason why He told this parable was because that there were some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Now that, that word righteousness or being righteous or just is a legal term. And the idea is that they trusted in themselves that they could waltz right up to God and have a relationship with Him. They could have a right, a just relationship with Him based upon what they were doing. And this all led them to be very prideful, be very arrogant people. And so they treated other people with contempt. As Nick and I studied with the high school students, we noticed that the Pharisees and the scribes, what they would often do is design these little loopholes in God's Word. They wanted to keep God's Word, and so they wanted to keep it so badly that they built a fence, a hedge around God's law with all of their man-made traditions. But at the end of the day, they were trying to keep their traditions and trying to find loopholes so that they can live however they wanted to live so as not to appear to break God's law. So they designed these little loopholes that would allow them to quote-unquote legally break God's law. And Jesus says that kind of righteousness is so shallow. That kind of righteousness, that's not good enough for my kingdom. And if you've got that kind of righteousness, then you're not welcome in my kingdom. The fact is we can't be made righteous outside of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. And that, brethren, is what makes the gospel good news. That's what the word gospel means. And that's why Paul isn't ashamed of it. Because the gospel, he says in Romans 1 and verse 16, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. There is a phrase that you can find at the beginning of the book of Romans, and you can find at the end of the book of Romans, in chapter 1 and in chapter 16, that is the phrase I want to focus on this evening for our time together. Paul begins this wonderful letter by pointing out the fact that he was made an apostle by the will of God about this, he's preaching this message of the gospel, how Jesus died for our sins, how he was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says that he was made an apostle through this Jesus through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about what? The obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. Now later on in the book, he, he says the same phrase in chapter 16. He says that God has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings. He's been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. What for? To, again, bring about the obedience of faith. And so Paul saw in his work as an apostle and as a preacher of this gospel, his goal was to establish this obedience of faith in the hearts of the people who heard him. That's the kind of kingdom righteousness that Jesus is advocating for in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It calls for the obedience of faith. Now the order of those words is very important. What, what we're trying to establish is the obedience of faith rather than faith in our obedience. Now there's a difference. The obedience of faith and faith in our obedience. Obedience that, that Jesus teaches us here in the Gospel, it springs, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, from faith to faith. That is, it begins and ends in a place of trusting in God, obediently trusting in God. And so God in the Gospel, He is the one who initiates our obedience. He is the catalyst to get us to change our lives to repent and believe and follow His Son. It's motivated, our obedience to Christ, it's motivated by God's glory. That's what we want, not self-glory. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes wanted. Our obedience, it proceeds from the heart, a pure heart that will see God as opposed to the heart of, the, of hypocrisy in the Pharisees and the scribes. Our obedience is an obedience that trusts in God for salvation and not in ourselves. John Stott wrote a book called Christ the Controversialist, and in that he talks about this kind of kingdom righteousness. And in that book he says this kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 5 and verse 20, it accepts the full implications of the law without trying to dodge them. It's an honest righteousness. It recognizes that the law's domain extends beyond the actual deed to the word and beyond the word to the thoughts and the motives of the heart. Pharisaic righteousness was an outward conformity to human traditions. Christian righteousness is an inward conformity of mind and heart to the revealed will of God. I think that's a good description of what Paul is talking about in the obedience of faith. He explains this obedience of faith. I, I think he summarizes it in one scripture in Romans chapter 6 in verse 17. And in that passage, this is what Paul says to the Christians in Rome. He says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That's going to be the lesson over the next 20 minutes or so. Romans chapter 6 in verse 17. And we're going to take it from back to front, from backwards to forwards there in verse 17. First of all, what are we obedient to? From where are we obedient? And why are we obedient? Those are our three our three main uh, 
headings here. First of all, what are we obedient to? We're being obedient to the pattern. The pattern. He says in verse 17 that you are obedient to that standard or to that form of doctrine. Your Bible might say in verse 17. That, that word standard or form, you could find that in, in Greek literature that wasn't religious at all. That is a technical term that would be used about a seamstress, maybe cutting out a pattern out of cloth, or, or a metallurgist who was making a, a mold and he would pour molten metal into a mold from which objects are made. And so the pattern is Jesus Himself. The pattern is His teachings and His example. And what His apostles went on to go and teach is the Gospel. And so we need to be obedient to that, that pattern. When we learn about Jesus, it's, it's, have you ever read the Bible and it just hits you right between the eyes and it points out the things in your life that are wrong and it convicts us of, of sin? Well, that's Jesus through the Gospel. He is convicting us of our sin and it's like He's melting us down, you know? And in, in this process of melting us down, and it's like we're going through this furnace, this purifying fire, and all of the impurities of our life are being burned away. In fact, that's how Malachi talked about the Messiah, didn't he? In Malachi 3 and verse 3, talks about this Messiah being like a refiner's fire. And what goes in has impurities mixed in with the metal like an alloy. And what comes out on the end is this pure silver or pure gold. That's us spiritually speaking. And when we come out of that furnace, this pure hot metal is poured into the mold of Christ. Paul says just a page over in your Bibles in Romans 8 and verse 29. Romans 8 and verse 29 that those whom God foreknew, He also predestined, what for? To be conformed to the image of His Son. So we are supposed to resemble Jesus. He is the pattern. He's the mold. We're supposed to look like Him. He's the standard that we have to conform to and be obedient to. And when we do that, when we're poured into the mold of Christ, God is forging us into His instruments of righteousness. And he fundamentally changes us. He changes how we think. He literally converts our thinking. He converts our affections. This, you don't have the same affections that you did before you became a Christian. He converts your desires. And so now, as we become Christians, as we become obedient to that pattern and poured into the mold of Jesus, the way we have to consider our lives is, I am a tool in God's hands. He can do good with me. He can do righteous things with my life. He is wielding me. He is, he is making other things good with me, with my life. In fact, that's how Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 6. He says in verse 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God to those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as what? Instruments for righteousness. There was one time in our lives before we were Christians that God was not wielding us. There was another master who was wielding us. Satan was wielding us, and he was using us to do his will, to do his unrighteous work and accomplish his wicked purposes. But now, you see, just like the Romans, by our obedience to the pattern in Christ, we're shaped again, we're forged anew for a righteous purpose. We are God's handiwork. And then God uses us to work good things of new creation. We are created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for good works that we might walk in them. These works that God prepared beforehand. We were once these vessels for unrighteous use, dishonorable vessels. Paul says, but now we've been cleansed and purified. We've become vessels for honorable use, fit for every good work, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 21. And see, the thing about this is that God does not do any of this against our will. He works with us. He wants us to make the choice. Notice again in Romans chapter 6 in our verse that the Romans were obedient to that form of teaching. 
That implies that there is an objective standard that was taught. It was presented to them. It was received by them. They molded over in their heads, what are the implications of this truth of the Gospel and how should I respond to it? All of that was taught to them, but these people acted upon it. That message of the Gospel was, the Bible says, committed to them in verse 17. The Gospel was presented, it was met with consideration, and then upon consideration, it was obeyed willingly. But that's not the end of the story. That's just the first third of the sermon. But mere obedience, right? Outward conformity to the Bible's teaching, that is not the obedience of faith yet. So what are we obedient to? We're obedient to the pattern found in God's Word, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Where do we need to be obedient from? Well, the Bible says we are to be obedient from the heart. Obedient from the heart. We need to be transformed inwardly. God works from the inside out. So when that form of doctrine or when that, that uh, you know, standard of teaching demanded repentance, demanded that the Romans be baptized, they didn't obey those commandments simply to check a box. Or, or, or so that people would stop breathing down their neck. Their obedience was rendered from their innermost being, from their heart, with trusting faith in the conviction of the reality, first of all, of their own sins, but also trusting in God's ability to recreate them, to restore them, to cleanse them. They had faith in that. Where did that come from? From the very depths of who they were, their hearts. In this inward response that we all have to have from the Gospel, it's intellectual in one way, but it's also emotional in another way. Some of us obeyed the Gospel because we were afraid of hell. But we're also obeying the Gospel because of the hope of heaven and the resurrection. Some of us obeyed the Gospel because of the pain of sin. That's why I was sick and tired of living the way that I used to live. I was tired of that. Hurting other people and hurting myself. And you want the healing of God's forgiveness. Some people obey the Gospel because of the wonder of God's love and our unworthiness. Paul says, just a page over in your Bible in Romans 5, he says in verse 5, this hope that God gives to us in the Gospel of the resurrection, it doesn't put us to shame. God is going to make good in His promise. This hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. We were weak. We were ungodly. He says that, that, that we were still sinners. And God showed His love for us. That's how far His love was willing to go. While we were His sinful, ungodly, weak enemies, Christ died for us so that we would be saved. And so that requires you know, the mind to weigh and grasp these concepts, but it requires a heart to be pricked and to feel and be affected by the love of God. And so it's an inward transformation, but it's manifested outwardly, you see. When the Gospel demands that we believe in our, in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 also says that we confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Lord. And so when both of these conditions are met, when this inward transformation manifests itself outwardly in, in the, the kind of way I live my life, it's going to result in salvation. Again, just a couple pages over, Romans 10 and verse 10, where Paul writes, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And he goes on to give scriptures to, uh, to, to prove that. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. And then he says in verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, expresses their need for a Savior and is obedient to the Gospel, will be saved. And so inward belief coupled with outward action, that results in salvation. You know, that's, you know the, the proof is in the pudding. External obedience, that's the evidence. That, that's the proof that there has been some inward change. And God knows the difference if it was real or not. God knows why we obeyed the Gospel. God knows why we were baptized. I'm thinking of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 when 
the prophet there was looking for God's anointed and he thinks that surely this is the next king to come along and God says, no, it's not that one. And, and God is trying to tell his prophet, you know, you need to stop looking at the outward, okay? That's not how I look at things. And so he says to his prophet in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, he says, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so he can tell what's going on inside of us. He can tell what we're thinking. He knows what's going through our mind. And another passage I think about is uh, 1 Chronicles in, in chapter 28 when David is nearing the end of his life and he's speaking to his son Solomon. 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9. And David, he says to Solomon, he says, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve Him with a whole heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. Don't you behave one way and be a hypocrite inside. If you're going to obey the Lord, you better go all the way. You better jump in the deep end with God. There's no fooling Him. There's no mocking Him. He sees past all of our pretenses. And so, yes, it's entirely possible to be, you know, appear to be near to God, but our hearts are far from Him. Jesus, in fact, quoted Isaiah to talk about the religious people of His day in Matthew chapter 15 that way. And so there needs to be an inward transformation. It needs to be manifested outwardly. And when we follow that pattern, then we're going to be rewarded eternally. One of the, the scariest verses in the Bible is Matthew 7, 21 to me. And in that passage, the Lord says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's going to be, apparently, many people on the day of judgment that had gone to church or whatever. that thought that they were Christians. that thought that, that their soul was all right. And here they're going to come up to Jesus and, and, and they're going to say, look at all the wonderful things we did for you in your name. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. In fact, you're not a worker in my name. You're a worker of lawlessness. And so there's going to be plenty of people who think that they've been doing the will of God. And they're going to be surprised when they look at Jesus. Jesus. And they're going to be denied entrance into glory. And sure, they might have even followed some of the right steps in the correct order or whatever. And they participated and their name was in the directory and all of that. But Jesus wants more than that. He wants your heart, you see. He wants all of who you are. Wholehearted devotion. And our obedience can't be merely outward to the Lord. If it's not rendered from the heart, then we're not going to be rewarded eternally. Why? Why are we obedient? Well, we do it for Him. We do it for the Lord Himself. You know, going back to Romans in, in chapter 6 here. When it's all said and done, when we finally come to the end, after we have obeyed that form of teaching from the heart and we've lived a faithful life in Christ, serving and loving our neighbor, we've done all within our power to do, there is absolutely no room for pride whatsoever. We have no grounds for patting ourselves on the back. Nobody will be in heaven saying, I deserve to be here. In fact, Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 23, just a few verses down, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin. This is what we deserve. We punch the clock. This is our paycheck. It's death. That's what we earned. But God gave us something that we did not earn. He gave us a gift that was free the Lord said this in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. Luke 17 and verse 10. He says, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, 
We are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. And that's how we have to look at our life here on earth. Stop feeling sorry for ourselves when things don't work out you know, the way we think they will. Just serve other people because we're serving the Lord. That's the kind of spirit we ought to have. We should have a spirit of servitude. We should have a heart of gratitude. What does Paul say in, again back in our, our passage in Romans 6 and verse 17? These people had changed their lives. God had done marvelous things with them. He had, he had saved them from their, thing, their, their, their sins and eternal death. And what does Paul say in verse 17? But thanks be to who? To God. Thanks be to God for what? Thanks be to God that you obeyed the Gospel. Thanks be to God that you, you obeyed that form of teaching. Thanks be to God that you responded in the way that you did, that you were obedient from the heart. Paul says in, in, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, he says in verse 30, And because of Him you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's because of Him. At the end of the day, it was God who made known to us the path of life in His Son. It was God who provided the sacrifice to atone for our sins. It was God who plucked us from the power of Satan. It was God who refined us and purified us and forged us into instruments of righteousness. It was God who first loved us before we knew Him. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us to show how magnificent and powerful God's love is. And so you say, well, are you saved? How do you know you're saved? Because I did this. Because I did that. Because I did this. There are things you've got to do to be saved. Don't get me wrong, but your sentence better not start out like that. Why are you saved? Because God loved me. Because God sent His Son. Because God loved me first. That's why I love my neighbor. Because God sacrificed for me. That's why I sacrifice to other people. That's why we know we're saved. Because God first, and certainly there are things that we have to do. Don't get me wrong. This is obedience, but it's the obedience of faith, you see. Obedience to bring God glory. Salvation is God's work for God's glory. One of the uh, wonderful passages in the Bible about this wonderful plan of, of redemption is, is this sentence in Ephesians chapter 1. He talks about all these great things that God in Christ has done for us. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He chose us in Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 in verse 5, according to what? The purpose of His will. To the praise of His glorious grace. Skip down to verse 12 where the same kind of phrase is, is mentioned. All of these wonderful things God has done for us. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory so that He can get the credit, you see. Skip down again to verse 14. This Holy Spirit, He's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. We sing... Amazing grace, don't we? Twas grace that brought me here thus far. What else? Grace will bring me home. As Peter puts it, the God of grace will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. As Paul puts it to the Philippians in Philippians 1 and verse 6, He who began a good work in you will bring it to perfection. Now, do you got a role to play in that? Yes. You're His tool of righteousness. You're His slave of obedience. Our role to play is the obedience of faith. But we must never lose sight of the fact that our salvation begins and ends with Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And He gets the glory now and He gets the glory forever.
You can close your Bibles and open up your hymnal to the song that's been selected, brethren. Do you have the obedience of faith? That was what Paul was trying to establish within people that would hear him preach. The obedience of faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who paved the way with His works, with His perfect obedience to the Father. In fact, the Hebrew writer makes this very point. He says, in the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death, and He was heard because of His reverence. Although He was a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. He was obedient. The Hebrew writer says, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey Him. And so He deserves our obedience. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And the Lordship of Jesus in your life. You want to know if Jesus is your Lord? You read the Bible. And you see how you respond to it. If there are things written in there that you refuse to do, then Jesus is not King over your heart. Are you going to respond with rebellion or obedience? Again, you want to be conforming to Him, right? You want to be following the, the pattern that was laid down in Him. Jesus is the one who laid down the pattern. He went to the grave. And God resurrected Him from the dead. And so He wants you to go to the grave too. He wants you to go to the cross and crucify self and crucify sin. That sin might be put to death, that the body of flesh might be put to death and done away with, and then you can be buried in baptism into His death where God will raise you up. He will cleanse your soul and you can walk with Jesus in newness of life forever. That's the obedience of faith. Do you trust in your heart that Jesus died for you and provided this sacrifice? If you trust in your heart with all your heart, then make the good confession today and show your obedience of faith in Christ.